So, I'm really looking forward to hearing our next speaker. I started coming, I just worked it out, looked at my LinkedIn profile. My first Govis conference was in 2010. And the thing I really enjoyed about that one, and have enjoyed ever since, is that I get to hear people who lift my head out of the day-to-day -day of my work, and I can scan the horizon and see what's going on. And, uh, and that requires getting people to speak like Owen McCall. And so I first heard Owen speak last year when he talked about gamifying the performance of your organisation, which is something I still think about. He spent quite some time as the CEO of the warehouse and now is working as a consultant. Uh, <clears throat> I did ask Owen, uh, as a part of an introduction for him, what kind of superpower he would have, uh, if he could have one. And he said teleportation so he could pop to Paris for breakfast. And I was really hoping it would be the kind of teleportation that lets you take someone so I could go with him. <laughs> so, Owen, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I, I speak a reasonable amount at various conferences, and I have to say one of the most embarrassing things for me almost consistently is um, listening to people introduce me. But actually, Matt, you did quite a good job of not really embarrassing me today. And who wouldn't want to teleport to Paris to have coffee on the Champs-Élysées for breakfast? Um, I reckon that would be cool to be able to do that. I suspect that, um, given the nice introduction, Matt, that probably the most embarrassing thing that's going to happen to me today um, is sharing my inability to take decent photos. Um, I'm well known within our family for um, taking <laughs> terrible selfies. And so this is pretty much the, the best selfie that I could possibly find. Um, and that with me is my daughter, my daughter Sarah. And she's important to this because um, many years ago it is now, um, she's a bit younger than what she was then, Sarah came home from, from intermediate school saying, I've got a school project to do, Dad. And would you be able to help me with the school project? Because the school project is what was life like in the 1970s? And, and you know, you were alive in the 1970s, so you should be able to tell me what life was like in the 1970s. So, well, of, of course I can help you, darling. Of course I can help you and help you and tell you what life's like with the 1970s. What would you like to know? And her first question of what was life like in the 1970s is, what were mobile phones like in the 1970s? <laughs> So after I picked myself up the floor from laughing, I had to explain to her, because I grew up in rural Otago, right? So I grew up on a farm in rural Otago. So for much of the 1970s, we had a party line. <laughs> Who here is old enough to remember party lines? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so, the, so, so for, the, for the graduate program guys who are here, I'll explain it to you later. No, perhaps I'll explain it to you now. So a party line, so a party line, for those who don't know what a party line is, is it's where basically there is one telephone line going up the road and everyone on the road is on the same party line. And, and the exchange operator, because we had real operators trunking calls at that stage, right, real people actually trunking calls, they would find out who the person was calling and they'd direct recall to the house on the line. And the way you knew whether it was your call or not was based upon the ring signal. So essentially it was Morse code, right? They'd send a Morse code message to you. Our ring was two longs. My uncle and auntie who lived up the road was a long and a short. And so you had to listen for your tone, listen for your ring call, and you had to be able to then figure out whether you're answering the phone or not. Um, of course, data privacy was an issue back then as well because you could listen into your auntie's conversation. <laughs> So, so I had to try and explain to her what a party line was in terms of answering the call of what was mobile phones were like. Um, the only other significant piece of technology we had in our house back then um, was I remember getting a colour television, because colour television hadn't been all that long out, and I remember getting a colour television. And that was technology, right? And, and having told her all of that, her, her fundamental response was, yeah, you, you truly did grow up with the dinosaurs, didn't you, Dad? <laughs> But that's only, what, 30 or 40 years ago, depending on what end of the decade you want to take. And a lot's changed since then in terms of all of the technology that's come around and all of the changes which are coming from a party line to the supercomputers virtually that we have in our pocket. A few years back, just in terms of supercomputers, um, there was a researcher, and I'm not exactly sure what they were researching, but they couldn't get enough computing power out of their Cray computer, right? The biggest supercomputers they were. So they went out and they bought three or four PS4s, strung them together, because that provided them with more processing power than what they could get out of the super power, a gaming console. But it's phenomenal what we've got, and all of that 
computer technology, as we all know, and you don't need me to tell you, is transforming the way in which we go about doing things within the world. And you can see that in some of the things which are happening in our economy really, really clearly. So this is a list of the world's most valuable companies in May, as produced by Forbes. Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and no, it's not in alphabetical order, Microsoft and Facebook, the Facebook, the five most valuable companies in the world. Now, none of them existed in the 1970s. In fact, most of them didn't exist until the 1990s, um, except Apple and Microsoft, of course, which happened in the, in the 1980s. But they have created literally trillions of dollars of wealth over that period of time, and they have surpassed every other organisation which has been around potentially for centuries from the beginning of time in terms of value. So the value creation that's happening is enormous. But most of us, when we actually look at this, what we look at is, is we look at technology and the value creation and we look at it as a threat. We don't look at digital and go, yippee, digital's coming. No, no, what we do is we go, disruption. Digital's here to disrupt and digital's here to take away all of the things that we know of as being familiar. And organisations across the world are worrying about digital, are worrying about digital disruption and are embarking on a whole bunch of um, programs, typically these days under the banner of transformation, right? Digital transformation to be able to respond. But they're typically reactive. And I reckon that's a bit of a problem because if you come to work going, I hope I can avoid being disruptive today, I don't reckon that's a particularly empowering context. And I reckon rather, well, let's come to work with a view to go, what can we do positively today to help create the outcomes that we want within the world? So it's great that the tech companies are making money. It's great that the tech companies are making money, but actually so are most other companies as well. Um, there are a whole bunch of different researchers, research around the impact of digital transformation when, in fact, we get it right. So this one came from a book called Leading Digital by George Westerman and others. Um, it's also published, for those of you who prefer shorter versions, um, in a white paper called The Digital Advantage, and it was co-produced by MIT, which is who Westerman works for, um, and Cap Gemini, who paid for it. And what they said is, is that they said that people who get digital right, and they said the, most, the things that determine whether you're going to be successful in digital or not is a combination of your digital leadership capabilities, the organisational leadership capabilities around digital and your ability to deploy the digital capability itself. And those who get it right in the top right-hand corner, which they called um, the fantastic name of the Digirati, significantly outperform all of their industry peers. 23% in, in terms of profitability and 9% in terms of revenue. Now, a lot of the time we sit there and we go, oh, cool. It's all just about, the, it's all just about putting the technology out on the business, right? All we need to do is put technology out in the organisation and it'll be amazing. But if you look at the guys there who are actually putting technology out in the organisation, right, so they have high levels of digital capability, but it's not done in a well-managed, well-led, well-controlled, orchestrated way, they're not necessarily doing that well. They're doing better than those that aren't doing anything, but they're not necessarily winning the game versus their industry peers. But the good news is, is, is that if we get it right, we can get into that digerati process, then we can start to be able to create the future that we need through technology. We can be the masters of our own destiny going forward rather than waiting for disruption to come and get us. And if you genericise that research, you actually start to get a process, sorry, you start to get a, a diagram that looks like this that says the better you are at managing your digital investments and your technology investments over time, then the more profitable you'll become or the more effective you'll become in delivering the outcomes that you want if you're a not-for-profit in a government organisation. To the point of being 40% better on average, if you start to look at that in terms of quintiles, um, and the reason for quintiles will become obvious at the end of the presentation, just to give you a little, uh, a little up, up, um, heads up on that, versus minus 40% at the bottom. Because of the way the maths works, that's nearly 100% improvement, right, in terms of the effectiveness of the organisation when you get it right. So that's pretty cool. So there's enough evidence out there that says if we want to be able to set aside the idea of disruption and start to embrace the idea of creating the future, it is in fact possible to do. Possible but not easy. So in November last year, 
Bain and Company came out with a survey of their clients, no, not of their clients, a global survey of the effectiveness of digital transformation across all sorts of organisations. And what they said was a massive 5% of those transformation efforts were successful. A massive 5% of those projects or those transformation initiatives were successful. 20% outright failed and 75% they got some benefits from it, but not enough to offset the cost that was being put in there, so it ended up diluting performance over time. Um, that's not a one-off, as much as I could cite lots of studies that says when you get it right, you can make lots of money, I can cite probably more that say most people don't get it right, they get it wrong. And so that one on the other side is a, is, is a report that was published in Forbes. It was published under the banner of 84% of digital transformations fail. It actually came from the research in, in the book for the digital halux. 16% succeed. Most of the rest don't make it at all in terms of the transformations. So we've got lots of organisations, because many, many organisations, in fact, I would venture to suggest virtually every organisation is embarked in some form of work, albeit if it's early investigative days, on what does it mean to become a digital organisation today. But most of them are failing. So it's possible to be able to create our future, but it seems to be hard. So why? Why is it so hard? Now, I don't know all of the reasons why it's hard, but I reckon I know some of them. And so what I'd like to do is go through some of them, and then we'll have a look at, well, what perhaps can we do about that? First one, and I know we've heard this has been a bit of a theme, I think, of the day, is, is that the first issue is, is that we think it's about technology, and that we think that the ability to transform is actually about the technology, and that most of the rest of the organisation who don't work in IT go, oh, I feel it's about technology. I'm just going to leave it to the technologists. I'm just going to leave it to the technologists and then everything will be fine. And you know how you get that saying that says, oh, man, if I could have a dollar for every time someone said this to me, well, there's been a bit of inflation, so I'm going to go, if I had $10,000 for every time someone came up to me and said, hey, what's our digital strategy? What's our strategy for the cloud? Oh, how are we going to use AI? I had one the other day for a client where I'm doing some strategy work. One of their executives had been away to a conference and they came back and says, hey, Owen, um, how, are we going to, how, how are we going to leverage blockchain in our organisation? <laughs> blockchain? Yeah, OK. Um, so t tell me, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, no, I don't have a problem. I just want to know how we're going to leverage blockchain. But these conversations happen all the time, right? We have executives who do whatever it is that they do at the various times, and having been one, I won't blurt away all those secrets, but, but having do what they do, and then they come back with cool ideas that go, oh, how about this technology? This technology will fix the problem. Can you just go and make that happen for me? Can you just go and make that happen for me? One of, the, um, one of my favourite Dilbert cartoons um, is on the, on the silk, and, it's, um, and you know, it's the, the boss guy comes back and says... Hey, I went to the trade show. I bought back the idea. Why is your part taking so long? <laughs> Why is your part taking so long? And too often in organisations, that's what we end up with. Is we end up with people going, it's a technology problem, and therefore it's up to the technologists to be able to solve it. We also have a whole bunch of people around the similar things who come back, and they pick their favourite tech company and go, oh, what I really want to be is I want to be like... I get lots of people coming, coming up to me and going, oh, we want to be the Uber of our industry. Huh, you want to be the Uber of your industry? Oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, I, just need, I just need to make sure that I understand what you mean by you want to be the Uber of your industry because um, here's, my, here's my perception of Uber. Um, first off, they're getting sued by all of their employees for a toxic culture and sexual harassment. <laughs> Second, they willfully go around the world and break all the regulations and rules within that country and third, they lost $3 billion last year. Now, tell me, what is it about Uber that you want to actually be? And, and, and actually, what they want, what they want is, is that they see the spectacular valuation, right? Not, not big enough to be on the top five. And they see the headlines it gets, and they get the press of Uber's disrupting the transportation industry, which it is, and they go, well, I want to be like that, without really understanding what it is. Because they think that what made the difference in Uber was technology. Was technology what really made the difference in Uber? No, I don't reckon it was. Because if you look at the core technology that they use, 
they use an app on a phone. You know, well, lots of people use apps on phones. They use GPS to locate you. Oh, that's pretty simple. Everyone can use GPS to locate you, particularly since it isn't theirs, it's Google's. They use GPS to locate a driver. They have a matching algorithm that says put the driver together with the passenger to take them to the place that they want to go. They have a charging mechanism which they run off of the geolocation, and they have the ability to take an online payment. Actually, none of that's very hard from a technology point of view, right? None of that's actually very hard. I can tell it's not that hard because I've seen taxi company apps that do basically the same thing. They've replicated the technology. They've replicated the technology. It's the same with Amazon. I was CEO at the warehouse for a while, so I've got a little bit of, um, uh, you know, I'm, I, follow, I follow Amazon with interest. And the thing that Amazon does in terms of its ability to interact with us, the public, pretty much every retailer in the world now can replicate. One difference, one click buy, because they patented it and stopped other people from doing it. But the fundamental principles of what they do from a technology point of view has been replicated. Yet Australia and New Zealand retailers are sitting there crapping themselves, if you'll excuse the expression, because Amazon's supposedly coming to town. Oh my God, it's a big panic. Amazon's going to disrupt us. As a CIO who used to work in the retail industry, I sit there and I go, really? Could you not have seen that coming 10 years ago? Why are you only doing anything about it now? Why did you sit there for over a decade until it became a huge problem for you? Because in the end, what these organisations bring that make a difference isn't technology, it's really about their strategy and business model. The reason the Amazon's a problem for the warehouse is because they do retail without stores. Why is that a problem? Well, because about 12% of revenue goes into maintaining stores and distribution to stores. Therefore, they've got a 12% cost advantage. This isn't mystical, this is economics. I reckon the reason Uber's so popular, and it's certainly the reason I use it, is it's cheap. <laughs> it's not because it's got a cool app, it's because it's cheap. I have to say, um, the average Uber driver seems to be much happier than the average taxi driver. <laughs> that helps as well, but actually I use it because it's cheap. It's a business model issue, it's not a technology issue. The reason these guys are taking on the world and winning at the moment is because they've adapted a digital business model rather than they use technology in a way that we can't. So we think it's a technology problem, and I really don't think it is a technology problem. Um, second one is, is IT. So traditional IT teams and departments are seen as being slow and expensive. Um, and, and, and I think in many organisations that's true, but what I would say is it's not necessarily in the IT team's control always to be able to change that. I was talking to a CEO of a large corporate uh, last year, and he was going, Owen, oh, they run SAP. SAP's their core platform, right? And he goes, oh, Owen, you know, we're in a competitive marketplace. We've got competitors releasing new products, new, new, new market offers every day, and we need to be able to react. But the problem is I can't do anything in SAP in less than nine months and for less than a million dollars. And then he paused and looked at me. And he went, actually, that's not true. First of all, I've got to spend two months and spend $50,000 to get a business case that tell me it's going to take nine months and a million dollars to deliver. <laughs> Sound familiar? I went, oh, right. I said, um, yeah, that is long, and I can see why when you're in a competitive marketplace than they were, having to take, in that case, you know, an average of 11 months to be able to respond to your competitor's offer is a bit of a problem. But, you know, I don't think that's an IT problem. It might be a project methodology problem in the way in which you go and deliver projects. You don't have to read that. That's a standard waterfall project methodology approach. Have an idea, think it's quite a good idea, do a bunch of work around feasibility to create a business case, do the detailed planning, blah, 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 blah. And yes, if you're going to do that and you're going to run that process, 
it's going to take you a long time. He says, but it's not about SAP. This is not a technology problem. Because that little red bit that I've circled, that's actually the only tech bit in there. The rest of it's your processes, Mr. Chief Executive, that you choose to put in place to manage your organisation and your business, and it has bugger all to do with the actual technical delivery. Now, actually, yes, we should work on improving that little piece and making it quicker, but that is not going to substantially change your time to market around changes in SAP because that's not what's driving the time frame. Organisational processes and practices and governance is driving the problem because they were built and designed for another time. They were built and designed in another time. Now add to that, partly because we're seen as being expensive and slow, lots of IT teams lack credibility with their business. Right. We lack credibility and people don't see us as being capable of being able to take the organisation forward. One of the ways you see this in terms of a lack of credibility within your organisation is you see people working around you. Shadow IT, they're working around you. Oh, we've got a CIO, but we thought we'd just go and appoint a CDO as well, working around you. And to some extent, the lack of credibility within the organisation is justified. Um, and part one, and, and probably those of you who heard me speak a few times before have probably heard me say this because it's one of my favourite examples. Um, but most of the systems that we provide to our users don't work very well. They just, they simply don't work very well. And so my test for how well does it work is I like to compare my car, and um, I have to say it's now my former car, my car and the stability of my car and reliability of my car to your systems. So I drove an 18-year-old Jag. Hands up all those who think an 18-year-old Jag is the icon of reliability. No, no one? <laughs> so on average, my Jag broke down once a year. And I could see it getting worse and worse and worse. Right? It broke down once a year, and I experienced a problem with it once a year. And eventually I sold it because I couldn't put up with it breaking down once a year. Guess how often the average user in a large organisation experiences an IT outage? Once a day. Once a day. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't actually the number of outages, right? But, but the average number of faults logged per user in the average organisation per year is six. Now, so if every fault logged only impacts one user, which of course is complete crock because the network goes down, everyone's out, right? Then that means they get disrupted once every two months. How long would I, or you, hold on to your car if it broke every two months? How long? You wouldn't. What would you do? What would you do? Get rid of the car? Or change your mechanic? Get the bus, yeah, yeah, get the bus. Buy an electric car. Because that'll be much more environmentally and friendly, at least until you have to dispose of the battery. But, but you'd get rid of the car, right? Or you'd change the mechanic. Outsourcing. Sounds like changing the mechanic to me, right? We lack credibility in our ability to be able to deliver systems. It's hard for us to be involved in the creation of value, the creation of our destiny, if people can't see us doing our core job properly. So let's talk about projects. We talked about digital transformation earlier on, but just any old normal program of change has a terrible rate of success. 70% of programs fail. 70% of programs fail. And the Standish Group, who, who produce um, a biennial chaos report, have you heard of the chaos report? It's one of my favourite studies. It's been going for about 20 years. And the numbers haven't really changed that much. But basically what they said is... Um, only 29% of all software development projects are successful. The other 71% are challenged or outright fail. Only 29% of software development projects succeed. That stat hasn't moved in 20 years. It really hasn't moved in 20 years. What's the last one I've got there? Oh, and the larger the project is, the less likely we are to be successful. So if you look at the Standish Report, fundamentally if you look at the Standish Report, what it says is large projects, what they, what they consider to be mega projects, have less than a 10% chance of being successful. There was another study done by McKinsey and Oxford that looked at mega projects. 
Um, and their definition of a mega, mega project was a project that had a budget of $10 million or more, an initial budget of $10 million or more. And what they found is, is that what they found is, is that organisations who undertook mega IT projects had a 17% chance of experiencing a brush with bankruptcy. Which, if you compare the two reports, and I probably shouldn't because there's actually no rationale for me to do it, 10% of large projects fail, 70% of organisations who undertake them might go bankrupt. It went so bad. The average performance of large projects, they found, was it took twice as long and not quite twice as much, about 1.8 times the original budget, nearly twice as much to do to be able to actually implement the project. So if we were honest and we put business cases up to our executives and say we wanted to do a large project, we would actually do one of two things. We would go, we reckon it's going to cost 10 million, but can you please approve 20 million? Or we take the business case up twice. Because that's actually a more realistic expectation about what happens. So we struggled to deliver day to day. We struggled to deliver our programs of change, which means we struggle to be able to be in charge of the creation of our own value. Now, we do want to be agile, right? And we do want to do things quicker and we do want to be more successful. By the way, the latest Standish report is showing an indication, it's not, it's not huge at the moment, but an indication that agile is slightly more successful than traditional waterfall-style projects. I'm not, I'm not going to really pull up the flag and go, it's absolutely conclusive, but it's starting to work. It's starting to work and it's starting to go there. Um, interestingly, just have a little aside, there was a study that was done by HP. They looked at DevOps and they looked at, pro and they looked at performance of DevOps teams versus DevOps process maturity, guess what they found? Those with immature DevOps practices outperformed those with mature DevOps practices. <laughs> Interesting, eh? So we do want to be agile. So we do want to be agile. But for most of us, if we're honest, we think agile is a methodology. And we reckon that because we've got someone whose job title is now scrum master rather than project manager, <laughs> that we're agile. We think now that rather than, that because we don't use Microsoft Project to put our project tasks in, but we put it on a whiteboard with a fucking sticky, excuse the language, <laughs> that we're agile. That doesn't mean we're agile, it just means we've changed our tools. Because if you want to be agile, what you have to do is you have to change how you organise. How you organise. The boxes in the chart needs to be different. We need to change how we work in our processes and how we pull that together. And most importantly, we need to change how our leaders lead the organisation. If you want to be agile. Because being digital is not really about technology. It's about remaking your business and operating model to one which is more agile more flexible, to be able to cope with the change and to be able to drive change the way change actually happens. Um, I'll just go back because, um, I'll just go back. So we talk about large projects, right? We're terrible at delivering large projects. The other part, right, and this starts to speak to some of the agility part of it, the other part is, is that the Standish Report does show us that when we deliver small projects, we're quite good at delivering those. Standish report says, although we are only successful 29% of the time on average, if we're delivering small projects, we succeed 70 to 80% of the time. So I have a theory. My theory is large projects, large complex projects, are difficult to implement. And the reason why they're difficult to implement is because they're large and complex. And that probably what we should do is think about delivering small, simple projects that we can understand and get right. And then do another one, and then do another one, and then do another one. Because actually all of the research into innovation, how innovation happens, is innovation occurs through iteration. It occurs through the interactions of people. There was a study done in research labs, and they were looking at where all the brilliant ideas come from the research scientists. Guess what they found? Most of the breakthroughs came through at the water cooler. Two scientists talking to each other. I was thinking about this and I'm doing this. Oh, that's interesting. Have you thought about that? Have you tried that way? Ah, the interaction caused the breakthrough. 
It's not the sitting doing the hard working, it's the interaction. The history of innovation is a history of interaction. Ah, do small, simple things, interact, see what happens. Who knows, it might work. And we're reactive. So IT teams typically are reactive, and, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why, um, and we lack influence because a lot of the reasons we've, we've gone out above. So historically, IT departments have been known as the department of no. Yeah? Historically, we've been known as the department of no. A user or a manager would come up and say, can I please have, and the answer is no, you can't. And there's a million reasons of either policy reasons or whatever they are as to why the answer is no. Now, thankfully, I reckon most IT organisations are over the department of no now, because I reckon most CIOs are going, no, 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 we're not the department of no. The answer is yes, we can do that. But there's a problem with saying yes as well. You know what the problem is? No idea what your priorities are, because you're going to get more requests than what you've got capacity to do. And if all you do is say yes, well, what are your priorities? If you've got more to do than you've got capacity to do, and you're not prepared to say no, you're going to say yes, well, where do you start? And actually, for most IT organisations, the answer is, well, we can't say no, we're going to say yes. We want to be service-oriented, which actually is the right thing to do. We want to be service-oriented, which is the right thing to do, so we're going to say yes. So what we'll do is we'll start everything. <laughs> ah, right. So you've got a reputation of being slow and complex, yep. How big's your IT team? 50. How many of those on average are dedicated to business as usual and how many are dedicated to project? I'm just making up numbers now, but let's say 35 are dedicated to BAU, 15 are dedicated to projects. How many active projects do you have? Oh, 50? <laughs> 50. All right, I think I know why people see that you're slow. Because we don't consistently walk the halls and have discussions about priorities. It's a really hard thing to do, right? To walk around the executive suites and go, what are your priorities? How does your priority in finance weigh up with your priority in HR, with your priority in operations? How does that work and how do we get the answer to that? Because the reality is, is everyone would be better off if we did less things, did them better and did them more quickly. But we try and please everyone and we refuse to conduct the prioritisation discussions that we need to be able to go forward. The worst case of this the worst case of this, and I won't drop any names, but they might be an extremely large local government body north of the Bombay Hills. <laughs> don't know what to do because we don't know our priorities. All oh, right, you're expecting the council, you're expecting the exec to provide you with the priorities, yep. Cool. Um, how many projects and project ideas are you currently got on our list? This is, well, based on what we know of, we've got 643 project ideas. 643. But we don't know what ones to work on because the executive won't tell us. Oh, I sense a problem here. If you were to take those 643 projects to the executive team, yep, and they decided to give you the time to prioritise them, which they don't have, right, because they're pretty busy people, A, how long do you think it would take, and B, do you think they have the detailed knowledge necessary to be able to make the right decisions? They don't, right? They haven't got a shit show. It's an undoable job. And then we sit there and go, well, they're not giving us direction. I don't know what my priorities are. Why won't the exec just tell us what's going on? Hmm. Why don't we facilitate a conversation across the organisation to understand and agree priorities and give them a chance to make a decent decision? Right? Why don't we start to do that? But often we don't. And so our users tend to work around us, right? Because we're slow and complex, because they don't trust that we can deliver the systems, because we have no track record of delivering our projects on time, because the systems they use break all the time, they go, bugger it, I'm going to go do my own thing. And that is the birth of shadow IT, or the continuance of shadow IT, which, from a user's perspective, actually, is I'm just trying to get my job done. And I can't get help here for whatever reason, so I'm going to go get help somewhere else. I'm just trying to get my job done, and I can't work with the IT teams to make it happen. <sighs> Anyone depressed yet? <laughs> uh, so I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go, well, perhaps there's some things we can do about it. 
perhaps there's some things we can do about it. Now, the destination here is, is about how do we make sure that we can use IT to create our future rather than be at the reaction. And if we're going to do that, we have to be able to resolve all of those issues, plus the ones I haven't yet thought about, but at least all of those issues, right? We're going to have to do that. And so the question is, is well, where would you start? Where would you start? Um, now, I hate the journey analogy, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to do it because every journey starts by knowing where you are today in terms of the ability to create value and to be able to create the future that you want. The way that I describe understanding where you're at in terms of the journey to creating value is what I call the IT hierarchy of needs. Um, I'm not a creator of hierarchy needs. For some unknown reason, back in the early days when I was CIO at the warehouse, I was doing an awful lot of reading around Abraham Maslow. Are you all familiar? Anyone familiar with Abraham Maslow? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hierarchy of needs of human motivation. And, and what he said is humans are complex. Unlike previous psychological theories before him that said fundamentally humans were simple. They only had a couple of needs, the need for food and sex and blame everything else on your mother. Maslow says, that's not true. Maslow says, we're actually quite complex. We have very, very many needs, but some are more fundamental than others, such that they form a hierarchy, and you have to meet the most fundamental needs before you can progress up the hierarchy over time. And I like the notion of a hierarchy of needs. I really like the notion of the hierarchy of needs that says, actually, organisations have many, many needs from IT, many things that need to be done before we can add value and create our future, but some are more fundamental than others, that we have to meet those so that we can then get the right to play at the next level. So we started thinking, well, what are those things? And I reckon the first one is the second one there. The first thing we need to do is make sure our systems are reliable so that when the people who use our systems walk into work, pick up their phones, whatever it is that they want to do to engage with the systems that we provide, that they work, and that they're fit for purpose and they fundamentally do the job. If you haven't done that, the bottom one's about destroying value. It says we, we spend a lot of money on IT, but it works sometimes, kind of like my jag breaking down all the time, right? So you have to be reliable. The next one up the chain is I'm going, well, we have to be efficient and effective. And, and, and I draw there what I call the line of competence, which is about great technology management. And to me, efficient and effective means um, we're good value for money. We deliver all of our projects on time, fundamentally on time, and our systems are still reliable, and we're easy to engage with and do business with. We're easy to do business with for those people who need to engage with us to make things happen. And to me, that's line of competence, right? That's great IT management. To get above the line of competence doesn't actually require more IT competence because above the line actually isn't so much about getting better at managing IT. What it's about is about enabling the organisational strategy. And so there's a bit of a switch you need to do from great IT management, baseline, seat at the table, but you have to get there. Then switch to be able to go, well, how do we become the digital enabler? Because if we can become the digital neighbour, we can be part of the conversation of creating value. We can become part of the conversation of creating our future. And then ultimately, how do we then take technology to, to differentiate ourselves, to be strategically unique, to be an Uber in our industry, an Amazon in our industry, who are strategically unique through the use of technology, not because of the technology, but because of the way it enables them to do business and the way it enables them to develop a business model which is hard to attack. And so we have to start doing that. And I reckon that in order to do that, there are three key things that we need to actually start to do on a day-to-day -day basis. If I turn this around the right way, it'll help. Number one is, is that we need to ensure that we get delivery excellence. Core thing within the IT team, we need to get delivery excellence. We need to take care of the basic business of managing IT. We need to make sure our systems are reliable and fit for purpose. We need to deliver our projects on time. And we need to deliver them iteratively, right? So we need to start delivering them iteratively. I don't care if you use agile methodology or not. But I care that you're agile. I can do quick waterfalls every bit as well as you can do Agile. In fact, you walk into some really mature Agile shops, and I walk into some really mature Agile shops, and I see their Kanban board. Guess what the basic flow of the Kanban board is? It's a waterfall methodology. 
That might be because that's the basic structure you need to be able to deliver IT, right? You need to understand some requirements. You need to do some design. You need to code it. The difference? They do little things, and they do them really quick, and they release them and test them and see if they work rather than doing big monolithic things. So deliver iteratively. Use Agile if you want. I'm not anti-Agile. Agile is a beautiful thing. If it, if it helps you be successful, do it. If you can't do it, just break down your waterfalls into rapids. Do lots of rapids rather than, <laughs> lots of, rather than a few waterfalls. Um, and it's part of your iterative development, right? Plan, execute, learn. And yes, learn's big for a reason. Because it's not what you do today that's ultimately important. It's how quickly you can learn to get better in the future how quickly you can grow and get into the future. We need to get a little introspective. We need to actually examine what we did, why we did it, why it worked, why it didn't, and we need to try something new if it didn't work. Or we need to spread the things that work and scale them quickly across the organisation so that we can get the benefit of them and go forward. And do the basics around fiscal responsibility. Make sure your CFO loves you because they still hold the purse strings in most organisations. And you do that by being fiscally responsible. You do that by showing that you're a good steward of the money coming forward. And you've got that basic business acumen. The next thing we need to do is, is that we need to engage and collaborate. IT can't do IT by itself, right? We think it's a technology problem and we leave it to the technologists. That is never going to work. We have to engage and we have to collaborate in order to be successful. Successful IT projects have a great mix of leadership, subject matter expertise in what we're trying to achieve, and technology expertise to make it happen, working together to make it happen. And we need to be able to make sure we do that together. Generally speaking, in my experience, collaboration requires one person to start and sustain and lead the conversation. Be that one person. Create the conversation and the discussion about IT. Create the conversation about what it can do. If you've got issues, talk about them. Own them. Resolve them. Clear the air and move forward. Because that creates trust. Clear the air and move forward because that creates trust. Talk about your priorities and agree them. Agree what they are and move forward. I was mentoring a young, a young up-and-coming leader. Um, he was seen as being a rock star within the, within the group, and the CIO had very high hopes for him, until he didn't. And all of a sudden he goes, you know what, he can't prioritise. Steve is useless at prioritisation, he can't prioritise, and I'm really worried about all of these things which aren't getting done, which are priorities, and I don't understand what's happened, because I used to think he was a great guy. Can you please go and mentor him and work with him? I says, yes, I can go and do that. So I went and I had my first mentoring session with him. We did the little pleasantry thing at the start, jousted a little bit, and eventually I couldn't stand it any longer, so I thought, I need to subtly launch into why we're here, and I went, you know, Steve, your boss doesn't think you can prioritise, and it's impacting your performance. <laughs> that is my version of subtle. <laughs> um, he went slightly ballistic. What do you mean I can't prioritise? It's his fault. Every time he goes away and talks to someone new, he comes back with a change in direction and a new idea, blah, 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 blah. It's not me, it's him. All oh, right. So what are we going to do? So we came up with an incredibly sophisticated process. Write everything down on a list. Tell me which ones you think are the most are the best, you know, are the most important priorities. Draw a line under the capacity that you have to do it. It's starting to sound like a Kanban board, isn't it? <laughs> Tell them what's going to be next, and then go and talk to them about it. So we went and did that, talked to them about it. Yet that went quite well. We got an agreed list of priorities. Excellent. And that was fine until a week came around and the CIO came back and did the same thing. And it's like, oh, well, remember, here are my priority lists. And they managed to, managed to, in a fairly difficult conversation, from what I can tell, work through and go, well, OK, this is how it sits. He then, without my prompting, he then actually created the Kanban board and put it up in his work area. Here are all the things we know about. Here are the ones we're working on because there are priorities. This is what we think's next. Dun, 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 dun. And he put it up visually in his workspace. So when the CIO came around and says, we've got this new thing, can you do it? And it's like, well, OK, let's put it on the board. Where does it go? Does it go here? And if it goes here, what do we put down there? Right. So it's a visual discussion of priorities. Simple, simple, simple stuff. But it worked. 
And his CIO loved it. His CIO knew what he was working on. He could see what the priorities were. He could engage in a discussion with him about it. And he told all the other managers to do the same thing. Shortest mentoring assignment I'd have ever done, but a very effective one. Because he took, he took the proactive stance of creating the conversation with the CIO around priorities. We need to take the proactive stance around the business. Too often when I talk to CIOs who have prioritisation problems and say I can't get the business to prioritise, I go, well, have you asked them? And the answer is almost always no. Take the step. Get out of the IT team, go and talk to your leaders, your fellow colleagues, and figure out what they are. Um, and commit to business outcomes. Um, pretty much every project manager I've ever talked to is scared of, of business outcomes. They don't want to commit to outcomes. We can't control the outcomes, that's the business's problem. All we can commit to is on time, on budget, to scope. I don't want to do anything else, that's why I'm here, is to deliver on time, on budget, to scope. Actually, no, you're not. What you're here to do is to work collaboratively with your peers across the organisation to deliver a project that adds value and produces whatever the agreed business outcomes are. And your job, if you want to be relevant, is to co-create and co-own producing those outcomes on behalf of the organisation. And you need to step out of the, I'm the project plan jockey, I'm here for time, cost and scope and I'm here to help you produce the outcomes. Imagine the trust that builds. Imagine their desire to come back and go, help me do it again. Help me create the future rather than just react to what's going on, if you can start to do that. And then you can move on to, well, what are the strategic opportunities, which is really where you get the chance. Final one is, is coming back to the Uber, Uber example. Is it's not technology that adds value. right? It's not the technology that adds value. It's the strategic uniqueness that technology allows us to be able to deliver. It's the strategic uniqueness that technology allows us to deliver that adds value. And so what we need to do is we need to figure out what that strategic uniqueness means for our organisation, and then we need to work to be able to deliver that over time. Part of that means you need to become a futurist. I don't know, if I was still at the warehouse, I'd be going, oh, perhaps Amazon might be coming, perhaps we should get ready 10 years ago, right? But become a little bit of the futurist as to where it is you're going to be going. Where is the technology going and how can it help us become strategically different? Which, of course, means you need to know the strategy. You need to know the competitive positioning. You need to know the customer jobs that you're trying to solve and be done. Then you can start to talk about, well, how can technology help to do that? And focus your investments on that. And deliver an architectured view of the world. I reckon too many IT teams at the moment, they're focused on roadmap. I'm here, we're going there, and here are the 150 projects we need to fund and execute to make that happen. And that's my three to five year roadmap, and it's brilliant, except the organisation can't afford it, um, you can't deliver it, and if we're realistic about the rest of the organisation, they don't want it. I think we need to step back from roadmaps that says this is exactly how we're going to do things. And we need to architect the future position around where we want to be. And then we need to deliver tactically to the user needs. Actually, this is the issue which is bugging me now. Cool, let's solve that problem. We can probably do it in a small, sharp project that delivers to you now. And then we can see if we've solved that problem. If not, we'll have another crack, or we can move on to the next issue. But build it to a plan, right? an architected plan so that you know what technologies you're investing in, and you've invested in the skills and capabilities in your team and in your partners to be really, really good at delivering those things. Um, back in my days at Deloitte, I was, I was in the SAP practice, so I know a reasonable amount about the whole SAP thing. Um, and we had a particularly difficult project going on with a client in Australia. With a client in Australia. Um, fixed price bid, fixed price bid. Ooh. Fixed price bid, um, but there was this one particular thing they needed to do, which you couldn't do in standard product, and it was going to require what was scoped out to be a three quarters of a million, a $750,000 enhancement. We were sitting there going, Phew, that means we're losing a bucket load of money. The client's sitting there going, actually, it's a fixed price bid. You need to deliver it to the requirements that we specified. It was starting to get ugly. 
Um, as it happened, in New Zealand, we'd, we'd employed a bloke. Um, I'll name him because it's a good story for his, from his perspective. His name is Hanno Shup. Right, so Hanno was an SAP expert. When I say he's an SAP expert, he worked for about 15 years at SAP and wrote big chunks of the system. Right, so he was an SAP expert. He had skills and capabilities in SAP up the wazoo. So we flew Hanno to this project and to this client. Come and have a look. Make sure that the scope of what it is that we're trying to do and the enhancement we're going to do is right. Try and figure out ways that we can minimise the cost that it's going to take us in terms of doing all of this extra work. So Hanno went in there, had a look at all the specs, talked to the client guys, talked to our guys, went, oh, OK, I think I understand what it is you want to do. Just give me a few hours. He literally went back, logged into their SAP development system, twiddled away for a couple of hours, came back and says, hey, guys, come and look at that. Is that what you wanted to do? And it was exactly what they wanted to do. And he saved a client relationship, three quarters of a million from our side. They got exact system they want. Why? Because he had invested in, in this case, his own skills and capabilities to make it happen. We spend so much time doing RFPs to select technologies and so much money doing RFPs to select technologies, but how much time do we actually spend developing our people so they can use them properly. That's like taking your teenager out to learn to drive, spending most of your time with them trying to decide whether you wanted to buy a Toyota or a Honda and neglecting to give them any driving lessons. <laughs> and we do it all the time. Architect, choose your strategic technologies, invest in the capability so that they can deliver the outcome over time. I must be about out of time, am I? Um, oh, and if it's not that important to your strategic outcomes, just use commodity. No one cares. You know, who cares about your mail system? Put it in Google, put it in Office 365, put it in whatever commodity you like, and let it just run away. Don't spend your effort doing things that don't matter. And that's it from me. Um, if you want to know more, I've just written a book. Oh, I've just written a book. Now, you have two options in terms of getting the book. One, you can go to... Well, actually, three options. One, you can go to my website, and you can buy it, and I'll send you one. Two, you can go to my website and get a link to Amazon, because you probably won't find it on their search function. They're not that good yet. Um, or three, I've got a few copies here, and if you're quick, first in, first serve, you can have a free one. Yes. <laughs> and that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll give you this after you answer the questions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I think the answer probably is what choice do they have? Right? Because it's not like we give them any alternatives. And and honestly, if our leaders, and particularly leaders in our traditional, um, our traditional organisations, what I'm increasingly calling analogue organisations, actually knew what it meant to become digital and operate in a different way, they'd probably stop doing it. But they're as much caught up in the old way of working and the old way of operating as we are. And in fact, they instigate it and carry it on. So I suspect there's some education around what, it, what the new world looks like that needs to happen still on a fair, bit of our, a fair bit of our senior leadership so that we can get them to stop doing that. Um, having said that, I still think we should stop asking them to do that and we should ask them to do smarter things. Uh, if digital transformations are failing, why are businesses so set on pursuing them? Um, because of media hype and because of hype around the business community that says you must and because of the fear of being left behind or trampled. Um, because the reality is, is that digital allows us to do so many things differently and better than what we have historically. And so there is a mandate to make that happen. We just need to figure out how to, how to get there and how to do it. Um, and we need to be able to not just think about implementing the technology, but recreating the organisation as a digital organisation with digital ways of operating, and not just do the delivery piece. Because it's really hard to be agile if you've got waterfall business case processes and waterfall PIR processes. And so we need to be able to create that whole ecosystem around it. Um, oh, and the other reason they do? 
Um, and the other reason they do is because they read the research like I do that says when you get it right, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of gains to be made. All right, so the prize is big. Uh, if only 29% of software projects succeed, why do we continue to undertake large transformational IT projects? Um, because we've always done it that way, and that's what we've learnt to do. And because we've got a whole bunch of processes and procedures that say we should do it that way. I, I reckon one of the things that we have to do in order to be able to make this transition is we have to stop identifying with what we do and the skill sets we bring that are about how we do it, and we have to reorient ourselves to why we do what we do. Because when you start to reorient around why we do what we do, the purpose behind what we're doing, the vision and the goal behind what we're doing, that starts to free us up to be able to let go of what we do and who we are. Right? Because if we identify with what we do and we get self-esteem from the skills that we have and then someone comes along and says, do it different, I don't know about you, but I find that personally challenging. I think the way around that is to reorient around why we do what we do and what the principles are that we stand for, which will allow us to let go of the old ways of doing things and hugging our traditional skill sets close to us. Because if we've always done it that way and we know how to do it that way, it's pretty scary to give it up because you don't have anything different from the person next to you because you're all novices again. That's okay if it's all about delivering on purpose. <sighs> Our execs seem to think that we can all, that we can be like Amazon with no investment in technology. Any comments? Uh, they're deluded. <laughs> Um, the comment is they're deluded. What I would say is that traditional organisations spend a lot of money doing things that don't add value, and if we get really good at getting those traditional things right, right, driving down the cost of BAU, because we're really slick at what we do, it'll start to free up money that we can invest. It'll start to free up money that we can invest. But every study that I've seen says digital leaders spend significantly more on IT than industry average. Makes sense, right, because they're doing a lot more things. Are we done or do I carry on? <laughs> We've made you work hard enough. Thank you so much, Owen. Thank you very much.